My name is Jill Charles. I am a nurse practitioner and my biggest fear when I transitioned to aesthetics was being able to manage patient expectations. It's just sort of my personality to always make sure that everybody is happy at all times and you know, starting a whole new skill set. Uh, I wanted to make sure that my patients were always going to be happy once they left my office. How about you, Nick? Um, I'm Nick, I'm a registered nurse, and uh, my biggest fear, I guess, when I started out was opening a new business. Um, I didn't know what I was getting into and fearful that I would fail, and now I have a thriving business and it all worked out. Hey everyone, I'm Crystal, I'm also a nurse practitioner. Um, I think my biggest fear coming into aesthetics was just the transition in general. I worked at the hospital, I came from night shift, I was working 12 hour shifts. Um, so even just the transition to a day shift job and coming to something brand new that I really had no idea about, I was um, obviously super interested in it and willing to learn, but starting out I felt like you know, you're starting at the bottom, you don't really know what's going on, just so that transition of building up that confidence, um, that was definitely my biggest fear. And I'm Lauren Niehaus. I am a nurse practitioner, the newest member here at AAFE. And I would say that my biggest fear when starting out is a vascular occlusion. Um, and I'll be honest with everyone, I haven't had one yet, and it's still a big fear of mine. I think vascular occlusions and compressions will always remain a fear of ours, and I think that they should be. It should, yeah. should always be something that we're, we're always thinking of. Um, I think the moment that you get comfortable and you lose that fear is when it becomes dangerous. Um, and both Nick and I have had experiences. I've had a patient that had a compression and Nick has had experience with vascular occlusions. Um, what do you think your biggest advice is for, for Lauren? I think the biggest thing is just having a protocol in place and just remembering, you know, where you came from and that, you know, these things can happen. Um, for me, I just had to keep cool, calm and collected for my patient um, simply because they were freaking out kind of. Yeah. And so we had to manage that and just make sure that they knew that I was prepared. Um, and every consultation that I'm, you know, with patients, I talk about uh, vascular occlusion and the potential for it, uh, what signs and symptoms to look for and make sure, you know, they know because they're your eyes when they leave your office. Um, and then just having those uh, protocols in place, making sure that your team knows what they are and how to recognize them as well. Um, mine ended up totally fine. It just is one of those things that if I wasn't prepared, I couldn't imagine ever picking up a needle again mm -hmm. from that point. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, <laughs> she was very, very yeah. thankful, the one patient that I had it, and um, she has been singing my praises since just simply because I was prepared for it. Had I gone into that not having you know, the proper protocols in place, it would have ended very, very bad. Yeah, so vascular occlusion, um, there's a couple things that can go wrong with dermal filler. Um, you can have a vascular compression where I explain it to patients kind of as if you had been standing on a, on a hose and it kinked that hose and so the blood flow is not going like it should be. So it's slowly watering the, gla the grass versus flooding it. Um, and then there's a vascular occlusion which is more so when the filler gets into the vessel um, and it actually stops the blood flow. Um, which can be very dangerous. You can have blindness, you can have a lot of other things, tissue necrosis, all of that. So it's a very medical procedure and I think that's the other thing too is making sure that your patients understand just how medical it truly is versus just getting your hair done or makeup done or anything like that. Right, I think a lot of patients aren't aware of um, those severe potential complications and you know, like Nick said, they have to be informed. After all, we are getting an informed consent for a medical procedure and so making sure that they really know what they're um, potentials are for side effects or complications down the road um, because we it's really up to them once they leave our practice to let us know like hey I have something abnormal that I think needs to be addressed um, and so as long as they're informed and they notify us in a timely manner we can address that and try and minimize the long-term complications for them as well. To avoid vascular occlusion we obviously use a lot of safe injecting techniques um, so here at the AFE, we are all trainers for the AFE, so we teach all of these safe injection techniques that everyone um, should be a certified injector when making sure you know, you're choosing an injector, that they are certified and educated and know what to do. Um, you know, protocols to follow in terms of when injecting filler, you know, not using too much product in one area, always watching the tissue, aspiration, um, things of that nature just to make sure that you're being as safe as possible 
Um, we always say even using all of the safe techniques though, you can still get a bad outcome. So, you know, don't look at it as you're in, you're safe if you're only using those safe techniques. Um, you can still have a bad outcome. So being prepared and really knowing, you know, what to do if you do have some kind of complication really shows, like Nick said, you know, if you know what to do, you're calm, you're collected, you know, if you're frazzled and looking all around, that energy is just going to radiate off of you and your patient's going to be freaking out. <laughs> and they're probably already freaking out. So if you're calm and collected and you know exactly what to do, they'll have so much trust in you. Um, I kind of... anatomy too is huge. Oh, for mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, Knowing absolutely. your anatomy, yeah, is I'm huge. studying it. Mm -hmm always yeah keeping up with it it's not just like a one and done type of course that you can take um, always keeping up with it yeah. so signs and symptoms of a vascular event so either a vascular occlusion or a compression um, these are things that I educate my patients on so that they know what to look out for once they get home pain pain is not normal after dermal filler you might have a little bit of discomfort for example if we do your cheeks in the evening you might have a little bit of discomfort when you go home but I by no means am I anticipating that you're gonna have 8 out of 10 throbbing constant pain in your treatment area so if you're experiencing pain that is something that your injector needs to know about immediately other symptoms that you would need to look out for or signs to look out for would be changes to the tissue so Think of like a, a lacy mottled rash on your treatment area. It might look like, you know, red sort of speckles. Um, abnormal looking bruising, a really dark looking bruising. Blanching of the tissue. So basically what that means is the tissue is sort of white. So imagine if you push on your hand here and then you release, your skin is white here. All of these are signs that the tissue is just not getting perfused like it should be. And these are times when you need to notify your provider. And my patient specifically, I had, um, she just started to have this little bit of red duskiness. It was like kind of a purple red color. Um, and then when I assessed her capillary refill, so just the amount of time that it takes for that blood to circulate back to the area, um, it was very delayed. So that was my biggest indicator, along with a little bit of pain for her. So, and the other thing, um, the, the next day after dissolving, she ended up with blistering, crusting type of uh, lesions on her skin, which is not normal at all. So that's just a sign that necrosis was starting to happen. And for Jill's, I remember she, she contacted you with pain. Pain. But looking at her, you know, if you saw a photo of her, you would never say, oh, something's wrong. You know, right. it looked fine. Right. The pain and uh, pain was really her only primary symptom. Um, and we had previously treated her chin and jawline before, so she knew what to look out for. She knew that previously she didn't have discomfort like that. Um, and then I, you know, if there's ever a patient I'm worried about and they're home, I will have them send me a video where they're checking capillary refill. So mm -hmm. I literally send them a video of me checking capillary refill on my face and then I say, this is what I need from you. So that way they know exactly what to give me back. And she did have a little bit of a delayed refill on her chin, which is where her pain was. Um, and that was just an indication that I needed to bring her into the office at that point and dissolve just before um, any further compromise of blood flow occurred. But how many hours was that for your patient? The patient contacted me the following morning. So I treated her the following morning. She said, I woke up today and I have a little bit of pain and this doesn't seem normal for me. I, I've never had this um, as we've done her chin several times before. So it was the following morning. And then as the day went on, you know, I said, okay, we did put a large volume in there and I, there were a fair amount of pokes. So why don't we just keep an eye on it for like the next couple hours? And over the next couple hours, that pain sort of continued to progress. So we brought her into the office. Mine was about 19, 20 hours yeah. after injection. So it can happen fairly quickly. So it's um, also important to know, like if you do um, choose to aspirate in your practice, that you're doing it each and every time um, and making sure that you know what product you're using and um, how long to aspirate. That's where a lot of times, you know, when we're teaching students, they want to just pull back on the plunger and just let, right, let go right away. Um, it's not really allowing that needle to pull um, the product that's already primed into it. It's not allowing it to actually pull back. 
um, and get an, an accurate aspiration. So um, a lot of people also feel that aspiration is something that is always going to be you know, correct and accurate. It's just another measure that we take. Um, I've had positive aspirations many times and I've been thankful that I did aspirate um, on that syringe when it happened. I'm sure you guys have as well. Um, but when you're dealing with something like a Voluma or a thicker product, you need to allow more time uh, for that filler to come back through that needle um, to allow for an accurate aspiration. Well, it's amazing to have uh, wonderful colleagues like this to be able to sit down and, you know, bounce ideas off of and express our concerns. You know, it's important to remember that it happens to the best injectors, um, but also utilizing the techniques that, you know, the AAFE teaches. Um, but thank you guys so much for sitting down and having this yeah. conversation. And a special thanks to Nick, who's joining us today from Phoenix, and we're so happy to have him here today. So thanks, everybody, for thanks, sitting down with us. Let Thanks, us know guys. if you have any other questions or concerns.